Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I am Dr. Manali Singhal, fellow in vitreo retina and ocular oncology, and I shall take you through this month's uh, top six articles. Let's start with the first article, which is a retrospective cohort study to evaluate the risk of diabetic retinopathy progression and systemic vascular events, including death, in patients with non-proliferated diabetic retinopathy with obstructive sleep apnea. Patients with non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with and without obstructive sleep apnea were identified. Patients were excluded if they had history of proliferative disease, uh, diabetic macular edema or prior ocular intervention, intravitreal injection, laser or parspena vitrectomy. Propensity score matching was performed to control for baseline demographics and comorbidities, rate of progressing to vision threatening complications need for ocular intervention and systemic events was measured at 1, 3 and 5 years. 11,931 patients in each group were analyzed after propensity score matching. There was found to be elevated risk of proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy in the obstructive sleep apnea cohort at 1, 3, and 5 years. There was elevated risk of diabetic macular edema in the OSA group at all time points, that is 1, 3, and 5 years. With respect to ocular intervention, there was an increased risk of intravitreal injection in OSA patients uh, at 1, 3, and 5 years, and similar trends were noted with laser photocoagulation, but not vitrectomy. Regarding systemic events, a non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy patients with obstructive sleep apnea had a greater risk of stroke, myocardial infarction, and death. So the study concluded that there is an increased rate of diabetic retinopathy progression to vision threatening complications, need for ocular intervention, and systemic complications, including death for patients with obstructive sleep apnea. Authors emphasize the need for improved screening measures of patients with NPDR and potential OS. The second article discusses the structural characteristic and long-term visual outcomes in eyes impacted by macular edema as a consequence of retinal vein occlusion that have undergone effective treatment with antivascular endothelial growth factor therapy. Inclusion criteria comprised 42 eyes of 41 patients with resolved macular edema after a minimum of 5 years since the commencement of anti-VGF therapy. During the final visit, several qualitative parameters using spectral domain optical coherence tomography such as the integrity of the external limiting membrane and the state of the ellipsoid zone and retinal pigment epithelium and the presence of retinal inner layer disorganization were evaluated. Additionally, a quantitative evaluation of the inner and outer retinal thicknesses was done for the purpose of topographical analysis. The most prominent qualitative correlation identified with best corrected visual equity during the final visit was connected to the presence of the drill and the integrity of the external limiting membrane. In relation to the quantitative aspects, a significant correlation was noted between the visual equity during the last visit and the parafoveal thickness in both the inner and outer retina. So it was concluded that the changes in the status of the external limiting membrane and the presence of drills serve as valuable OCT biomarkers indicating prolonged visual outcome. The third article evaluates the safety, efficacy, and imaging features of, uh, of a noble surgical technique that is temporal internal limiting membrane flap without endotamponade in repairing complex macular hole. Complex macular hole was defined as a basal linear diameter of more than or equal to 400 micrometer and or associated with high myopia. It is a retrospective review of consecutive cases with complex macular hole which underwent uh, past planar vitrectomy with temporal internal limiting membrane flap which was stabilized using perfluorocarbon liquid and viscoelastics. At conclusion of the surgery, the PFCL was removed and no endotamponant agent was used. 24 eyes were included and the mean 
basal linear diameter was 988.3 micrometer. Visual equity, pattern of macular hole closure on OCT, formation of uh, epiretinal membrane and operative complications were reported. So, macular hole closure was achieved in 24 of which 8 achieved type 1A closure. The mean post-operative logmar visual equity improved from 0.93 at baseline to 0 0.74, 0 0.51, 0 0.55 and 0 0.52 at 1 month, 3 month, 6 month and last follow-up respectively. Four-way gliosis was observed in 3 uh, eyes and 10 developed nasal ARM. One eye developed vitreous hemorrhage which resolved spontaneously. So this study concludes that this novel surgical technique which requires no endotamponade is effective in achieving complex macular hole closure. A substantial proportion of patients developed ERM and its clinical significance requires further investigation. Our fourth article assesses the functional and structural outcomes after treatment with prednisolone eye drops in the following pachychoroid related diseases like chronic central serous chorioretinopathy, pachychoroid pigment epitheliopathy, and peripapillary pachychoroid syndrome. In this retrospective study, 54 eyes of 48 patients with pachychoroid related disease were treated with prednisolone acetate 1% eye drops 3 times a day. Change in macular volume and retinal central subfield thickness on OCT was measured. In addition, the foveal or complete resolution of fluid and the change in visual equity was studied. The follow up visit was at mean of 41 uh, uh, plus minus 14 days. In the four, 44 eyes with chronic central serous chorioretinopathy, a significant reduction in retinal central subfield thickness and macular volume was observed. Foveal intra or subretinal fluid resolved completely in 22% of the eyes. In the 8 peripapillary pachychoroid syndrome eyes, a reduction in the nasal retinal thickness was observed. One of the two pachychoroid pigment epitheliopathy eyes uh, showed structural improvement and no significant change in visual uh, equity was observed in any of the pachychoroid spectrum diseases. So it was concluded that in patients with pachychoroid related disease, atmical improvement was observed after therapy with prednisolone eye drops while visual equity did not change significantly. The fifth article tells us about the new technique to improve visualization in vitrectomy from gas induced cataract. Lens feathering due to intraocular gas may cause significant challenges with intraoperative visualization during posterior segment surgery. Herein, the authors describe an intraoperative technique for improving the posterior segment visualization impacted by lens feathering, in which the light pipe is used to gently massage posterior subcapsular lens vacuoles to improve the surgical view intraoperatively. So, authors found it to be an effective and efficient technique to improve lens feathering during vitreoretinal surgery without need for cataract extraction. The sixth article is a systematic review and meta-analysis which studied the correlation between vitamin D and retinal vein occlusion within the medical literature. It was conducted until December 10, 2023. A meticulous literature search was undertaken to identify and analyze all observational analytical papers reporting vitamin D levels in retinal vein occlusion patients. The principal outcome measures centered on the comparative assessment of vitamin D levels between patients with RVO cases and those devoid of RVO. Total of six relevant studies consisting of 589 participants were included in this meta-analysis. The results indicated a significant association between vitamin D deficiency and increased risk of retinal vein occlusion. And patients with retinal vein occlusion exhibited a significant decrease in serum vitamin D levels by 1.91 nanogram per milliliter. Moreover, there was no significant difference observed in vitamin D levels between central retinal vein occlusion and branch retinal vein occlusion subtypes. So it was concluded that RVO patients have more vitamin D deficiency than healthy controls. These results 
contribute to the growing body of evidence highlighting the intricate role of vitamin D supplementation as both a prophylactic and a treatment strategy in our. Thank you.